Father God, we look to you. There is no trustworthy thing. Only you are our strength. It's only in Christ Jesus that we can be saved. So Father, we turn our gaze to you. We open our ears because we want to hear from you today. We, we do so in confidence knowing that it is not your will that we should live in, in darkness but in light. And so we ask you, Father, through your Holy Spirit to give us understanding and enlighten our minds and empower our spirits that we might honor you and be a light, allow the light of Christ to shine through us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You're asleep in bed when your alarm startles you awake. You grab your phone on the nightstand next to your bed to look to see if there was any news overnight. And you see the headlines filled with approaching storms, murders in the city, wildfires in the west, stock markets plummeting, inflation is soaring, there's scandals in your government, there's war across the globe, and instead of getting out of bed, you pull the covers up over your head and roll over. You're aware of what a fearful world that we live in, and you dread facing the challenges of, of the day. But maybe your fears are not in the news headlines. They're about your job. You live in constant fear of being laid off or your work being outsourced or some other circumstance that will cause you to lose your income. Maybe your deepest fears lie at home. Will you be able to meet your rent or your mortgage payment this month? Is your marriage on shaky ground? Maybe your sweet little baby has grown into a teenager and you're very, very fearful about their future and what will happen. Many times we're fearful about things that might happen. And that word might haunts us. Our greatest fear is the conditional might. Fear trades in the market of the possibility or even impossibility. Fear is the tyrant of the imagination. It imposes on us from the shadows, from the hazy mirror of maybe. There's no doubt about it. We live in a world that is often a very scary place to be. When we face these fears that prompt us to pull the covers up over our heads and retreat from the world, what will we put our hope in? Will we exert our energy in wishful thinking, crossing our fingers, reading our horoscope, listening to talk radio, or will we hold our breath in hope that luck will go our way this time. The Bible talks about hope, but the biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It's not a lucky chance. It's not ungrounded optimism. It is a rock-solid belief in the character of God. This is not to say that we're guaranteed rose bushes without thorns, or a life free from tragedy or disaster or trouble. But because we know that God is all-knowing and all-powerful, and he is for us, we can face down our fears and trust the outcome of our circumstances to God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 tells us, 
that now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The antidote to fear is faith. And faith gives us hope, that certain hope, that belief in the character of God to, to guide us and that he is in control of our future. Faith gives us hope to face whatever scary thing that is in our lives. When the Apostle Paul was giving counsel to Timothy, his young protege, if you will, he knew that Timothy was afraid of something. And I think he knew that Timothy was having fear about his assignment to oversee the large church at Ephesus. Timothy was raised in a small town in Asia Minor, and Ephesus was the big city. And Paul had been and spent three years in Ephesus building up the church there, and now he was entrusting Timothy to lead. There was a group of elders there, uh, but the false teaching was causing problems. There was some folks there who were teaching some heresy, some things that were not true. And Paul was putting Timothy in charge to pastor those people and to point out the truth about these false teachings and, and bring them back in line with the gospel of Christ. So Timothy was supposed to be the leader. And here's this kid, kid I say kid, but he was a young man, um, from a small town being asked to come into a church in Ephesus in the big city and lead them back to the truth there. And I'm sure Timothy was freaking out a little bit. And um, so he was fearful and what young pastor would not be in that situation. But what did Paul say to Timothy in this situation? Well, it's recorded in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. He reminded Timothy that this fear was not placed in him by God. Paul knew that when we get God's perspective on the source of our fear, that we can set aside what is not from, from him and embrace what is from him. In all my years of following Christ, studying the word and, and um, helping to encourage and disciple Christians, I have yet to find a fear for which God does not have an answer. And the reason for that is simple. God himself is the answer to our fears. It's not about understanding why we fear. It's not about us confronting fear in our own understanding and strength. But it is about relying on God and, and, and pursuing him. When I think about it, fear is almost always based on the future. Sometimes we're afraid because we know what's coming. But most of the time we fear because we are afraid of what we don't know about the future. Whether the future is just a minute from now, maybe you're in the doctor's office and you just had an MRI and you're waiting for them to... Of course, that takes more than just a minute, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> you're waiting on re medical results. Or years from now, you worry that you won't have enough savings to um, retire, or even in the nearer term, you won't have enough to uh, afford your children's education, um, post-high school education. And, but regardless of that, fear's home is in the future. But what is the future to God? To him, the future is now. We live inside of time. Time was created for our benefit. We live inside time while God who made it lives outside of time. We know little about the future while God knows everything about the future. 
all the events of our lives fall really into two time frames, past and future. The present is a continually fleeing <clears throat> infant. It's just a moment that becomes past even before we can define it. God, on the other hand, has only one frame of reference, the eternal now, in which he sees and knows everything. What we can consider past, what we consider right now, what we consider future, it is all one with God. God is always aware of everything from eternity to eternity. So God doesn't think in terms of past and future. He has an awareness of all of it in the present. So therefore, God knows everything about us. And that's why God is the answer to our fears. If the light is on, we are less fearful. And the light is always gone on with God. If God is good and loving, and he is, if God is all-powerful, and he is, if God has a purpose and a plan that include his children, and he does, if we are his children, as I hope you are, then there is no reason to fear and every reason to hope, that certain hope, for God is in control. I know that that's good theology and you probably believe it, but we still have fears and apprehensions. You still have a hollow place in the pit of your stomach, either sometimes or all the time. It is one thing for a person to say they don't believe in ghosts, but it's another not to be afraid in darkness and in uncertainty. Okay, did I get my pages out of order? Hang on. Here we are, yep, okay. How do you help a little child face her fear of darkness? First, you appeal to their mind. You turn on the light and show her that there's nothing scary in her room. You look under the bed, you show them there's nothing under there. So you train their, their mind and their brain to see there's nothing to be afraid of present. Then you help attune her heart to what her mind has accepted. This is the process of faith for all of us. We accept that God is in control. And on that basis, we choose to shift our burdens to his perfect care. So that what we believe, we also trust God concerning. Because I know, I don't know about you, but I know there are many things in life that I know the truth, but I don't act upon what I know. And we can trust God and not fear in our uncertainty about the future because God's got it under control. But what about, what about our perceived uncertain future? Our future is not really uncertain. God knows it in the present. Our future, he knows. But what about our perceived uncertain future? Pessimism doesn't work because it's another form of mental enslavement, always expecting bad to happen. Optimism may have no basis in reality. I'm perfectly capable of that. There is only one way to walk with hope and confidence into an unknown to us future, and that is to stake everything on the power and goodness and faithfulness of God. To understand why God is the answer to all our fears, we must understand what the Bible says about fear. And it says a lot. It tells us more than 300 times, fear not. Fear not is the most frequently repeated command. 
The word afraid occurs more than 200 times, and fear, the word fear, more than 400 times. And lest you think that the Bible, that our Bible heroes were fearless, more than 200 individuals in the scripture are said to have been afraid. And not all of those were the bad guys. Many were the main characters. David feared. Paul feared. Timothy feared. And men, many countless others. Heroes of the Bible that had fear. Moses certainly had fear. When, he, when God told him to go to Egypt, you know, he was, oh, I can't talk, you know. But God sent him nonetheless and empowered him and gave him a helper, Joshua. Biblical heroes were regular people who had to learn the same things that you and I must learn. To drive out fear by increasing their knowledge of God. To shift their focus from the present fear to their eternal hope. To replace what they didn't know about the future with what they do know about him. I see fear as a real and present danger in the body of Christ. Many Christians are not living lives free of fear, and there could be serious consequences when that certain hope in Christ is absent. Scripture tells us in Luke 4 and verse 18 that Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus came to set us free, free of fear, fear of all the things that enslave us. God is our refuge and our fortress, a shield and defender for those who trust in him. Psalm 91 verse 2 and through 7 tells us, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. God is our refuge. God is our fortress, our shield, and our defender. My hope and prayer this morning is that this word will help you grow in your conviction that God is the answer to all your fears, that you will look to the future and see his power and his love guarding your every step. That's what I get for buying that thin, cheap printer paper here. All right. <laughs> In C.S. Lewis's Narnia book, The Silver Chair, I believe third in his series, I believe, the young schoolgirl, Jill, finds herself alone and desperately thirsty in an unknown wood. She knows nothing about Aslan, the Christ figure in the Narnia series, but when she comes upon a stream, she sees the great lion between her and the water. Jill stops in her tracks too petrified with fear to either advance or to run. If you are thirsty, you may drink, the lion says. And Jill asks, will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come? I make no promise, the lion answered. Jill says she will find another stream. But the lion responds, there is no other stream. Throughout the Bible, people are admonished to fear God. Is this fear to be equated with Jill's, that of a child quivering in terror at an all-powerful being who forces hard choices and may do anything to anyone at any time? 
The same God who invites us to come boldly into his presence also expects us to serve him with reverence. And a godly fear. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. A godly fear. God wants us to serve him and come into his presence with confidence, but yet a godly fear. But what does that mean? Patty and I experienced a house fire in our home seven years ago. I can't say with confidence that fear is an apt description of the emotion that we experienced. I can, I'm sorry, I can say with confidence that fear is an apt description of the emotion we experienced that night. Did it also experience a sense of awe? Yes, it did. But I don't think it was awe that caused us to flee the house that night. It was a fear of perishing in the flames. Not that the fire had any intent to harm us, but that fire has an innate nature that can harm us if we do not respect it. And God inspires an overwhelming awe. That is the godly fear commanded here. It's not the fear of the consequences of a situation. Our fear of God is a a deep, deeply inspired awe. Yes, God inspires that awe, and this is the godly fear that I'm talking about. God will act according to his character and nature, just as fire will follow its natural nature and will, if there is oxygen, fuel, and heat, right? God has a nature, and he will follow that nature. We can count on it. That way, that's, that's very helpful to me, at least, in discerning God's will in situations is, what is God's character? How, how have I seen God work? And, and to know that if I'm seeing something or moving in a direction that is, seems contrary to what God has shown me of his character and nature, then I better go back to the scripture and, make, and, and really pursue uh, his will in my life. So God will act according to that nature. Um, God will act, always act, according to his providential intent for his world. And we best align ourselves with that intent to keep from getting burned. I, years ago, I, 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 I studied um, knowing and doing the will of God. Uh, it was a study that I did. Um, and, and it talks, one of the things it talks about is being alert to God's activity around you. And rather than saying, God, give me a revelation, God gives us the ability to see where he's working, where is the spirit active, and not to be just consumed with looking for signs from God, a thunder or something, but to let the Holy Spirit show you where God is working and join him in that. And um, so God will act according to his, his providence and we need to align ourselves with that intent. Biblical references to the fear of God fall into two distinct categories in Scripture. The first I'll call awesome dread, and the second is astonished devotion. And when the Scripture talks about fearing God, it will fall into one of these two categories. So let's explore the meaning of these two. First is awesome dread. The term awesome dread dread seems to indicate something we should avoid rather than embrace. 
It's easy to focus on the love of God and that Jesus is a friend of sinners, but that is only one side of the equation. Unless we balance our perspective, we end up with the idea that we don't need to fear our old buddy God. And God is our friend, but God is also just and right. And there will be consequences when we choose to disobey him as his servant. And we choose to disobey. So when we go to the scripture to adjust our perspective on that, do we discover that fear is just a synonym synonym for awe and reverence? My answer to that is no. It's not exactly that. In Genesis, where the word fear is first used in the Bible, we read about God walking in the garden just after Adam and Eve had eaten the forbidden fruit. God had made it a practice of enjoying fellowship with them. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So, God had, we know the story in the first section of Genesis, God made the heavens of the earth, he, he, he separated the light from the darkness, he separated the, the seas from the land, he did all the things, he created people. And now, God, it says, was walking in the garden of the cool of day. Apparently that was, it seems to me that was God's, it was his pattern that he would, would come and, and he wanted fellowship with with Adam and Eve uh, in the garden. And uh, so God wanted relationship with his creation. And, and before sin, he would walk with them in the cool of the day and have fellowship. But then Adam and Eve had sinned. God knew this, but he didn't change his pattern. He still came and walked. Uh, but Adam and Eve's response changed. Rather than um, when they had no sin, they, they fellowshiped with God. As soon as they had sinned, their response to God was to hide. They hid themselves or tried to hide themselves from God's presence. And I assure you that Adam, what Adam felt in that moment was more than awe and reverence for his creator. He was afraid. He was stone cold afraid. Exactly as he should have been with sin present. God had warned him that if he ate of the forbidden tree, he would surely die. So therefore, the sinful man, God comes near, and he knows he's exposed. And he, he, he will not stand in the presence of God. He, he is trying to hide And um, God had warned him, and he knew that he had violated that. Both he and the woman had violated that. So we do not fear what we do not know. And that's why children are not instinctively afraid of a hot stove. But once they are enlightened, they probably ain't going to put their hand on that stove again. And it's the same with us. People who are without God are without fear of God and do not hesitate to act in an immoral way. And that's why um, we as Christians are to share Christ with them, not, not to necessarily try to chastise them for their sin. Of course, of course, they don't know God. They, they have no awareness. So our job is to share the gospel point them to Christ. And, and that's why repentance comes. Repentance is required unto salvation is because they, they, God brings an awareness of their sinfulness and their need for Christ. And, and then comes the repentance and falling at their feet, uh, at his feet and receiving Christ. So, um, those who know God fear him. In Scripture, we see that Abraham... Abram, Moses, Joshua, Gideon, 
Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Saul found this fear of God so overwhelming that they fell to their knees or fully prostrate, prostrate in his presence. Jesus is gentle, loving, compassionate, but that's not the whole picture. If we have sin in our lives, then there is a good reason to have an awesome dread of God. In Revelation chapter 1, in verse 17, the scripture tells us, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. This is not a voluntary act of worship, but an instinctive reaction of that awesome dread in the presence of God. The Apostle Peter gives us a primary reason for our awe and dread of God. After a long night of unsuccessful fishing, Peter was discouraged, and then Jesus performed a miracle, Luke 5, 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So we know that story, fishing all night, nothing. Jesus is on the shore, tells him, throw your nets on the other side. Peter says, we've been fishing all night. (laughs) But he did so, and God filled his net to the point where it was breaking and it was going to sink the boat. Um, But the reaction of, of people knowing their imperfection, their sinfulness, um, is to have that awesome dread. Awe and dread are natural and appropriate, appropriate responses of the imperfect to the perfect, of the marred to the beautiful, of the contaminated to the pure, of the powerless to the powerful. So awesome dread is it, when Scripture tells us to fear God, fear his response to sin, fear his wrath as a sinner. The second category of, of godly fear in the scripture, I'm, I'm calling it aston- astonished devotion. If awe and dread are appro- appropriate responses to God, how do we reconcile that with Paul's confident statement in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As Christians, those who have surrendered their life to Christ, is how I'm defining Christians, they have abandoned their right to their own will and and given their life to Christ. As Christians, we can live with absolutely no fear of the wrath of God. That That is an assurance engraved in eternity. When Christ died on the cross, and rose again. God's wrath was transferred from us to his own son, Jesus. And we no longer have to fear that wrath of an eternity in hell, that wrath of being separated from God, because God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. His presence is certain. So though we should have an awesome dread in terms of respecting God's view of sin and how he will react to sin, confess that sin, and receive the grace. So we should walk in that awesome dread of God. We can know and be astonished at the fact that he has taken away our iniquity. He has taken away any need for a fear of God's uh, abandoning us. So if Christ has removed the need to fear the wrath of God, do we really need to fear God at all? Paul answers this in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He says, 
You still, you're looking, you're, you, you are astonished at his grace. You are overwhelmed at what he did for you. And therefore, you are devoted to following him and allowing his spirit to mold you. There's a word called sanctification to make you more in the image of Christ in your, in your daily living. And that's what astonished devotion does for us. We should fear God even because his grace has removed the consequences of his wrath. We find the answer of why we should do that in the explanation of the Bible's second conception of fear, astonished devotion. Though God had every right to judge humanity in astounding mercy, he sent his own son to stand in the judgment for us. To fear only God's power with awesome dread, without fearing, respecting, and reverencing his astonishing love is an incomplete response that diminishes our experience and enjoyment of him. That astonished devotion of thanksgiving for what he has done resulting in obedience and service and, and those things, it diminishes our enjoyment of relationship with God. When we appropriately fear God, our fear of other things and other people begins to wane. When our smaller fears are absorbed by the appropriate fear of God, awesome dread and astonished devotion, our lives gain security rather than become debilitated by the terror of an uncertain future. When we consider both dimensions of the fear of God, awesome dread, and astonished devotion, we discover that the Bible promises abundant benefits for those who hold these fears. In conclusion, I would like to share with you a few of those promised benefits. The promise of provision. Psalm chapter 34, verses 9 and 10 says, O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The promise of protection. Psalm 33, verses 18 and 19. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. He gives us the promise of purity. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. And also 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to the completion in the fear of God. The promise of prosperity. Psalm 128, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways, the evidence of our proper fear of God. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You will be blessed, and it will be well with you. Prosperity in our spirits. Satisfaction, it says, you will be blessed. Okay? And, and so that is the prosperity. I don't... I won't expound, but it's more than just stuff. The promise of per perpetuity. Psalm 103 and verse 17. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to, the children, to their children's children. These are only a sampling of the promises the Bible gives to those who fear the Lord, who rightly fear the Lord. It is true that there is a consequence for not rightly fearing God, but it's not as if God extracts a pound of flesh for our failure. Instead, the consequence we face is that of missing the blessings that God has promised. It's like a child missing Christmas morning. Who would want to forego the spiritual treasures of fearing God? Yet he leaves that choice to us.
Let's pray. Father God, you are almighty. You are just and right. But yet, you satisfied the penalty that we owed for our sin in Jesus. Father, help us to have a proper proper attitude toward you and to seek your Holy Spirit's strength and understanding so that we can obey your commands and do that which you've called us to do. Help us to have a proper awe toward you. And Father, also, we are so grateful. We are astonished by your love. We are astonished by your goodness. And therefore, Lord, give us courage in our devotion to serving you and to pointing people to the truth of the gospel that they might have faith in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.